Welcome to part two of Creative Force with Pat Martino. Today, Pat continues from part one by demonstrating his minor conversion concept for improvising over various chord types, as well as common chord progressions. Then he shows how the augmented triad can be used as a parental form for creating many triadic inversions. You'll also see Pat perform some of his uniquely beautiful solo guitar arrangements. And in the special interview section, Pat talks about his musical influences and life growing up as a player. The following demonstrations are for um, of just a few simple forms that you can see as alterations and the substitutions that I would play that are in general to those alterations um, are extremely compatible at all times. So that uh, even though I'll be playing in this particular case an F minor 7th, which will be the uh, substitution for a B flat 13, by the same token, if you were to take an F minor 7th and look at it in its first position, uh, the most obvious way of seeing it, you're going to see a number of factors involved in it. Um, if I if I take the, the top triad, you'll see an A flat major triad, and this can be uh, at at that point con uh, considered to be a polychord, a polyform, which would be A flat major over F. By the same token, if I were to use a form that uh, says uh, an E E seventh to avoid the open strings down here, which would voice it in this octave. E seventh. If I raise that, the perfect fifth of that, I have an E seven sharp five. If I continue along the alteration itself and lower the ninth of that with an F on the top, it'll sound like this, like this. In this particular case, I have F minor over E. So the same F minor is going to hold true to it as well as a pure F minor seventh. Still F minor seventh. F minor over G. Still going to hold. The second inversion of the F minor 7th chord in a 6-4-3-2 group, string group, being the E, D, G, and B strings in this formation, its second inversion would be here, as it is showing itself to you here, it, it, it looks like an A flat major 6, so an A flat major 7th or 6th would be adhere would adhere to this uh, alteration and substitution for it, still being controlled by the F minor seventh. This being the second inversion of the F minor seven in a six four three two group. In the key of A flat, now we have an A flat major six. If we drop the five, we have an A flat major six flat five. 
As before, the positions for these F minor groups here second inversion would be here third inversion would be here fourth inversion would be here Okay, in the case of this, I now would like to hear a pure F minor 7, and I'll play the F minor 7 pattern against that. The second alteration would be, let's say, a B flat thirteenth. <laughs> The third inversion, let's try a D minor 7 flat 5. Why? Because here we have F, F minor triad over D. Let's hold on that D minor 7 flat 5 and even add another additional pedal tone to it, which would be an open E for even more dissonance. You see, in that particular case, what I just did here was I took this F minor 7th form, generally speaking, and instead of resolving that on an F, I resolved it at an open E being so available with no, no strain, no pressure. One more time. Placing more volume, more interest in that E as a, as a resolving tone. So now we have that. Of course, by the same token, as I said earlier, the A-flat major 6th does apply to the A-flat major 7th. So if we hear it now with the A-flat major 7th, I'm going to be a little bit more concerned with the melodic uh, context. <laughs> Now the E7 sharp 5. And finally, F minor over G.
particular case, we have f minor over g over e. The next series of changes are going to be uh, used for the sake of um, very simple improvisations. On, on my part, the, the uh, comfort for the minor seventh families. Uh, in this particular case, resolution has a great deal to do with an additional factor uh, in terms of the power of, of fluent playing because of activity in all of the different areas as we've discussed so far. Uh, in this case, what, what uh, we're going to be doing is uh, the A minor 7th flat 5, the D 7th flat 9 sharp 5, and a G minor 7th. Uh, and of course, if there's a turnaround for a repetition to that, it would be an E 7 sharp 9. The forms sound as so. The A minor 7 flat 5, the D 7 uh, flat 9 sharp 5. And then the G minor 7th. Turn around. To play against these chords for the A minor 7 flat 5, I'm going to be using the top portion of, of that chord. It forms itself as so. If I take the top triad of that, it's a C minor. And in the case of, in the key of C, it would also be the addition of the sixth, which is here. So again, that's why this sounds so, and feels so comfortable for me. D7 flat 9 sharp 5, in the case of, of a flat 9, the top of it is, is still in the case of uh, uh, F sharp, C, and E flat. The difference in this case being, even though I can use a C, mi a C minor 7th for it, or even an E flat minor 9, resolution makes it easy to move into the G minor 7th. So far we have A flat or A minor 7 flat 5. That particular position for what we've talked about is here. And then the D7 flat 9. And what I've just played in there is E flat minor 9. First, I'd like to hear it as a, an E flat minor 9 straight ahead, and I'll play the same line for you. And then, as also, the same line. You see the difference in terms of resolution being that I ended that last note the first time on the E flat primarily because that is what was uh, floating in space around that. And the second time I ended it with a, a D natural because of that. So that's the only change in it. That is the only difference in the two. And if you want for resolution dissonance, uh, it's excellent in, in concordance with that. So. Even if I use the E flat down low, you have an E flat on the top of that as a flat nine in the key of D. So I have both both worlds, the best of both worlds in doing that. Uh, then it's going to uh, resolve to G minor seventh. And then finally a turnaround like an E seven sharp nine, which gives me the use of an F minor seventh. So the E seven sharp nine like this, 
a, a large portion of that form is in here. <laughs> So one more time, the A minor 7 flat 5, C minor 7th. D7 flat 9 sharp 5, E flat minor. G minor 7th. E7 sharp 9. A minor 7 flat 5. <laughs> Okay, so you see how that's fitting. Uh, coming back to the use of that in a really um, uh, practical kind of way in terms of what we've uh, uh, pictured so far is the positions of this activity. So that in this position that I've been playing in it, it's still the first position. If we move it into the second position, not due to this, but uh, uh, based upon the minor seven substitution. Uh, here, I placed it here for comfort, the first position. The second position of this minor seventh chord, the first one's here, the second one's here, the third one's here, and the fourth one's here. C minor as it is, it's still going against an A minor seven flat five, so we're in two worlds at once, the best of both worlds. So I played it, played it here for you. The second position will be in here. Not here. By the same token, using both of them together fluently gives us both spaces, b the best of both worlds, so that that same chord, A minor 7 flat 5, I still have that flow. Uh, with the resolution, we'll take it from the A minor 7 flat 5 first. Um, here we go. So you see there's motion 
also with resolutions there's transformations of activity in all of these areas and in many cases uh, if I'm going to be moving from let's say an A minor 7 flat 5 uh, I find it comfortable be, uh, as I said before with the chromatic uh, uh, motion it, it sort of places my hands in different um, uh, areas of the guitar like this <laughs> It keeps it clear uh, intervallically so that I have access to dissonance as well as consonance. Dissonance being the motion from one uh, form into another, transposition, and consonance being resolution, the note that I choose, whether it be in the case of this chord uh, ending on here or more consonant like this, more dissonant like that. Or the next series will be D minor nine or minor seventh, G seven sharp five, the C major seventh. E minor 7 flat 5, turn around. A7 sharp 5, so. Okay, D minor 9 is going to be used as a D minor 7th on my part for substitutions. G7 sharp 5. There I'm using an A flat minor. A flat minor 7th. First position here. Second position here. Third position here. Fourth position here. The third one, C major seventh. I'm using an A minor seventh against that. Now the turnaround would be E minor 7 flat 5, there I'm using G minor. A7 sharp 5 flat 9, there I'm using B flat minor. Okay, all four of them in line with each other, uh, starting with the uh, D minor. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
Each and every instrument has uh, a number of automatic procedures. Um, unlike all of the things we learn through experience, one by one to um, place in our vocabulary of ideas, rules, regulations, and so on and so forth, such as a G major seventh chord, a G major seventh flat five chord. These are all uh, things that have to be memorized. And with the guitar itself, uh, they're not automatic primarily because the fingerings uh, per se 
are different fingerings, and it's very difficult to structure these as a basic example of the instrument's automatic machine, as a machine. The piano uh, in Western music um, is based upon two automatic things, very much like the guitar, but not quite the same. Uh, we're dealing with mathematics here. The piano has uh, white keys, seven white keys, and five black keys. These are totally automatic. In other words, if you were to play a C major scale, they're going to be the same throughout the octaves in the position of them horizontally as an instrument on the piano. On the other hand, the black keys uh, are totally pentatonic at all times. The guitar has two things as well, the augmented chord and the diminished chord. These are two things that, um, uh, two systems that have no change in the fingerings per se, um, other than three positions that, where they are located across the entire fingerboard. Before we go into these uh, automatic devices on the guitar, I think it's important to bring to your attention that uh, the piano's white keys are seven in number, and the black keys are five in number. Seven plus five equal 12 addition. On the guitar, the, the two major automatic systems are augmented and diminished. In the augmented, there are three positions. Here on a 3-2-1 string group, we have those positions located as so. There are three. The next one, of course, is here, and th that's an octave higher than the first. So there are only three, and they're a major third apart in terms of single steps in ascent on the fingerboard. Uh, the diminished chord has four groups, being as so. And as you notice, fingerings are not changed. So uh, in ongoing procedures, we're going to discuss the diminished chord, but we're going to begin with the augmented family. Here we have a major third apart. The diminished is a minor third apart. There are three of these and four of these. Three times four are 12. Unlike the piano, which is addition, the guitar is multiplication and is difficult for us to adhere to rules and regulations from the piano itself uh, solely because the guitar is a different machine. And we have a vertical context as well as horizontal, where the piano itself has solely horizontal. Like the diminished chord with all of these keys at our disposal in a row, four keys here, four here, and four here, adding to 12, the fifth is the inversion of the first four, which would be the second inversion. Uh, along the lines of the augmented form as a parental device, it elaborates itself in giving way to quite a number of pure triads which are highly uh, classical in terms of idiomatic use and function. Here in the augmented uh, form, if we take the first chord here as very much like the diminished chord, having three names within itself dimensionally, there's a B flat, a D, and an F sharp in it. That augmented chord can be called any of the three terms. B flat augmented, D augmented, and G-flat augmented. By raising any single tone in that cluster, that triad, by raising it one half step, it then becomes the root of a pure minor triad. Therefore, a B-flat augmented with the B-flat raised to a B natural becomes a B minor pure triad. Back to the augmented. The D in that cluster of three tones now being a D augmented, when raised one half step to E flat, we now have an E flat minor triad. Back to the augmented parent. The G flat, as a G flat augmented, raised one half step to a G becomes a pure G minor triad. So now we have three pure clusters, and in terms of expansion of this information, Keep in mind that there are three of the 12 keys stacked vertically in this cluster. By raising it one half step, the same procedure brings three more keys. Here as B, 
E flat and G augmented by raising any single tone one half step. It becomes a pure minor in that particular key. B to C is a C minor. E flat to E is an E minor. G to A flat is A flat minor. When we do this in a row, four of these in a row, such as this, will give us 12 keys of three groups of minor triads, pure as they can be. The next cluster is the second inversion system of the first. Therefore, we've got this to consider. Now let's add to that the strings being used for the cluster. In this particular case, the third string, the second and the first. And we'll refer to that as a string group. The same thing occurs when we use the fourth, third, and second strings in a cluster. And the same occurs with a 5-4-3 group. Again, the same thing occurs with a 6-5-4 group. When we lower any single tone in that triad, the opposite occurs. Instead of a pure minor triad from the augmented, the parental form, it then becomes by lowering any single tone, it becomes the perfect fifth of a pure major triad. So in this particular case, if we uh, concern ourselves with the third string being the dominant factor, uh, B flat at this particular moment, and we lower that one half step down, automatically we have the perfect fifth of a D major chord, primarily because B flat to A, the A is the perfect fifth in the key of D major. So now we have the augmented, and we do this with that. By lowering any single tone one half step, it becomes the perfect fifth of a major, pure major triad. So in this case, we have D major, G flat major, B flat major. Like all of the others, it will give us three in each fret position of it in the first area of activity. Three here, three here, three here, and three here. The second uh, system will give us three more in, in their second inversion. Therefore, if we take the augmented form with automatic inversions, unlike any of the other chords that we've learned, singularly. We have a great deal more information at our disposal in years to come, which is a, a lifelong endeavor, not only with the augmented, but of course also with the diminished chord, in this case being pure. So that if you take note, there are three different kinds of triads, fingering-wise. In the first one, from the B-flat to the A, we have this form of fingering, and that covers that D major. If we take the same augmented chord to its next inversion here, and we lower one more time the B flat to an A, it now will appear like this in its fingering. And if we go up one more high, and we take the B flat to an A, it will now look like this. So now you can see on a horizontal context that these particular clusters have three um, fingerings for them in one key, which would be the inversion of the first. Therefore, D major here, D major here, and D major here. One topic. In the case of one position in a vertical context, we have three different keys of the same cluster, but with the same fingering stacked vertically. So that now we have D major, G flat major, and B flat major. They all remain in contact with one another. The use that I, I, I find extremely interesting is a certain kind of idiomatic position for the music itself in creating music of this, um, this nature. So that when I am thinking of major and minor triads, uh, in many cases, uh, I find it extremely useful for, for idioms of form such as uh, something like this.
And here you can see the pure major. They can be stretched into different usage. We can also include these forms in connection with the diminished family as well, so that we have other usage such as this. Here being governed in this particular case, this being a D, a D dominant seventh chord, coming from the diminished family, by lowering the E flat to a D, gives me this form. So I keep it within that uh, uh, group of, of forms that I use quite a bit. This being a B7 sharp five altered. When you lower the, the five to a B seventh and raise the B to a C one half step, you have the diminished parental form that uh, gives us access to these alterations. And when used in, uh, in, in balance with the other parental form, which is the augmented, which we are talking about right now, we have this kind of freedom. Here, uh, I'm winding up in this particular grouping of strings, which is a 5-3-2 group, not adjacent, with this A-flat minor, pure minor triad, which came from this augmented. So in this case, I, I have a great amount of, uh, let's call them colors, or, or, or uh, forms that uh, I find extremely pleasing. If we take these same forms and apply them in, in different kinds of ways with different string groups, uh, again, this is an explosion of a, of a basic amount of material into endless proportions that is impossible to take advantage of all at once. And, and I think the most important thing uh, that has been for me in, in my experience is having a constant, um, more or less a, a fountain. Um, a box, like almost like a Pandora's box once opened, it gives way to endless structures that we didn't have to ask a question about. We know the source and the, and the, uh, the format that causes this to happen, and from that point forward we're, we're teaching ourselves from deep within, uh, based upon our own enjoyment. So I think that's important to keep in mind. <laughs>
Okay, as I've said, the, d the augmented form, in this particular case, uh, string groupings do control some of the possibilities I find extremely comfortable. Uh, we talked about uh, this particular augmented chord. Of course, it embodies a great deal of, of both pure minor triads and pure major triads. Uh, the string grouping itself is an adjacent grouping. Three, two, one. Uh, the same grouping in the case of, of the next set would be 4-3-2. The next set would be 5-4-3. And the next would be 6-5-4. Uh, the same thing applies to all of them in terms of either raising for a pure minor or lowering for a pure major. See how pure they are as triads. By the same token, not only do we have adjacent forms in terms of string groupings, but we also have non-adjacent forms. Uh, in the case of, let's say, a, a form like this C major triad, uh, and in this particular case, I'll play it here for you. It's on a 6-4-3 group, and there's a space in between. The fifth string isn't used. So now we have, and of course, that came, that pure major triad came from this augmented form. In this case, are the automatic inversions from that group. The only difference is that these are non-adjacent forms. This is a 6-4-3 uh, a 
4-3 group. The same form, let's say, on a 5-3-2 group, a 5-4-2 group would be like this. And in the same context, that has, has been drawn from this particular augmented form. Of course, it's, it's here too, which would be, in this case, fingered like that at a closed fret, that being a 5-3-1 group. These are all non-adjacent groups, and I, I think it's important, uh, as well as this one up here, which is a 4-3-1 a, a group. For you to cover these uh, different shapes using different uh, string groups so that you have more control over resonance, sustain, and uh, quite a number of things. Some of the things that I have used these for, uh, which I'll, I'll shortly be involved in playing through some of it, are forms like this. Now in this particular case, I could have said this. But I took it with an open string because of the pedal. And as I said before, now this particular form can be seen two ways. In the case of, of this chord, I can see this as a, a, a sus chord, a G sus. Or I can also see it as, as a polychord, which would be in this particular case F major over G. So it does uh, uh, bind itself and interact with the diminished family of endless alterations, four chords themselves. So here, uh, I kind of like this feeling. And here, again, the augmented family in a 5-3-2 group. Here I'm using this pedal tone for more length, since I'm not playing it with the fingers, I'm playing it with the pick. And in this particular case, in, in, uh, in my own personal use of such structures, I find it extremely helpful just for uh, the synchronization of this on a consistent basis to use nothing but down pick. And I rarely give thought to how I do pick because it's, uh, uh, in most cases, it's, it's the aftermath of spontaneous combustion. So uh, I, I think this is important to bring to your attention that whenever I'm, I, I use this for my own comfort, I like to use it with nothing but down pick. And if you take a look at, at the, the, the pick itself and, and the hand, uh, I'm forced to have to do it like this. you can see that in this particular composition, which um, is, is titled Country Road, um, I'm taking advantage of private um, interaction with my instrument on, on a, uh, a basic, uh, almost like a lonely relationship with it when I'm, I'm by myself, as opposed to having the advantage of a rhythm section with me and audience. So most of the compositions that I do use these uh, for uh, it comes in terms of solitude, and, and it's extremely helpful for me to have this at my disposal with these pure forms. And I find this extremely comfortable. So. The augmented form, for me personally, as a parental form, uh, gives me the, um, the strength 
to take advantage of a, of, of a very a delightful way of uh, a relationship with my instrument on a solo basis. And on the other hand, in terms of career orientations, I so far have really taken advantage of the diminished parent, which gives me access to bebop and, and to certain forms of fusion that I've enjoyed uh, taking advantage of. <laughs> In my case, there have been certain things that I have used, as I've briefly described with the plectrum itself, different sides of it for, for warmth or for a more sharper attack. That, yeah, can, I do use that at times. There are other things such as this, with fingering on the right hand, that gives me the opportunity of, of taking advantage of the position of the next area of activity on the guitar. So I have given thought to, to both hands like that, so that here, if I do something like this, you see, if I wanted to land and resolve into a chord like that, I would definitely need to have my first finger on that tone. And if I were to hold that tone there, it would be impossible for me to get this particular voicing. But by the same token, if I were to have it on the same string that I wanted at, and I had my finger there, it still would be impossible without a break-off uh, to, to grab at it. Therefore, I've found it practical to utilize techniques such as this. You see, so that uh, no matter where I am, I can then uh, use that to uh, contribute into new areas of, of motion so that things like that so that the eye when the when the eyes are closed the listener would find it extremely uh, impo just about impossible to be able to figure what hand was done and how it was used when we speak uh, we we fail to find any importance in just the words alone in other words if i were to say the same thing when we speak we fail to find the importance of anything alone in these there has to be some kind of emotional dynamics in life itself. When we walk, we don't walk the same step in the same pace, unless it is necessary for other reasons. The same thing in speaking, the same thing in writing, uh, the same thing in playing. 
this is life, and this is natural to uh, a personal endeavor to have an identity of your own, which is uh, fulfilled with colors. Not only the, the prism that we draw these colors from and the spectral factors of it, but all of the hues and, and uh, gravitational factors, emotional factors, surrounding environment that we're functioning in. And I think the same thing realistically uh, applies to being a player as well. Because if I have certain emotional feelings um, and I have something that I want to say and embellish those feelings upon without losing the flow of um, a, a confirmed approach to saying and to be as truthful as I can at any time, I can do this. <laughs> It's very difficult for me to do that just for the sake of the notes in it. It's more important for me to... Uh, you see, with, with a, a slide in and out, a pulsation which is just as natural as the beating of my heart. These are dynamics for me and are not, in my, in my experience, I, I gain no insight through uh, school uh, information coming from curriculum in terms of education itself. But in terms of experience of practical um, uh, interacting of all of these things that I've learned, not only from music or about music, but the people that I've had the opportunity um, to be able to interact with accordingly. So dynamics has a great deal to do with your feelings for life itself. And uh, I think these things cannot be taught primarily because they're of no use you know, in, in that context. I can say this: one of the um, uh, one of the, one of the most beautiful feelings was when I was with Lloyd Price's band, an 18-piece band uh, in the early '60s. Uh, in that band was, uh, good Lord, Charlie Persip was in, was a drummer, and Red Holloway. I first met Red, tenor player, in that band, and he was like my father on the road. Um, Slide Hampton was in the band. Uh, Stanley Turrentine was in the band. Tommy Turrentine was in the band. Um, endless players. Anzi Matthews uh, was involved with it. I can go down the line with names, and each of these people had a different uh, uh, addition to gaining insight on my behalf. They helped me to do it. You know, when I was with Lloyd Price's big band, I didn't know how to read. And I was brought into this through uh, lovable affairs with people who I, uh, I was really in, in balance with, and we had a lot of fun together as players. Most of them were a lot older than I. Red Holloway was like my dad on the road, you know, in the early years, and many times uh, at rehearsals, I would come into the rehearsal, and due to the fact that I didn't have the, op I didn't have the ability to read the music in, in those early years, uh, I, well, there were placing the stands together for the music and the set for a sound check or a slight rehearsal, I would say to uh, ask Red, uh, Red, how does that go? What is that? And he would play through it once, you know, and uh, I would have the opportunity of hearing how it went. And that's it, it how you did it. That's how I did it, yeah. yeah. And I found it necessary to learn how to read music and write music later on, only to be able to answer questions to so many people who gained interest and gave me a formidable reason to exist. I think it's important for a young player uh, to keep in mind that to be a little bit too perfect too soon is going to really place uh, quite a bracket on uh, his, uh, his or her identity. And that isn't a smart thing to do because it's based solely upon competitive uh, functions. Again, we lose sight in the beauty of the music itself and um, expressing oneself in an artistic um, contrast with the environment, the culture, the cultural facets that are included with it. And I think this comes from being with people, helping others in the process, a demand from others to be helping you in the process as well. Insight is gained from this in, in, uh, at many angles that have nothing to do with music. And music alone is just really nothing but intellectual information. To see it written on a page does not say anything. It says absolutely nothing about the emotions, the heart, the feeling uh, that uh, 
if one enters um, improvising under conditions where there is anger, it isn't necessary not to feel angry or to, to uh, uh, contain that inside because it isn't written on the chart. If I feel angry and I go on that set to play, you will hear that. You might think as a transcriber that it should be on the page and that I did it in that way primarily because it was written there, which in many cases it will be written there after it was done. But it doesn't work that way. It's backward from that. And I think you have to be in, in blend and in balance with all of the things that you're, you're feeling all over, all at once. Not only the instrument and its demands, primarily because it's no more important in its own right than a spoon or a fork. This guitar is my fork, my utensil. As far as the taste that it will use properly, bring to my uh, behalf, that's in the food itself, and the food is life. So I think it's important that students uh, do not pay too much attention to nothing but the curriculum. There, has a, 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 there is a great deal of information that is coming from the people that you have the opportunity to interact with in our culture, in our society. West Montgomery was like a phantom. You know, to be uh, 13 years old, 14 years old, and to hear um, not only a great technician, but someone who was drastically different than all the others that have gotten you that far, um, and in blend, blending with them. You know, my earlier years, um, Johnny Smith was one of the first, and then came um, Hank Garland, and Howard Roberts, and Joe Pass, and great, great players. Charlie Christian, of course, Eddie Lang. And when you, when you hear players like that, and you, and you give yourself, magnetically give yourself up to them as a child, you're involved in the midst of dreams. And when those dreams come true, uh, reality causes you to step back. And you don't see it um, as much as, as a, um, a, a mythical human being. You, you don't see this person anymore on a mythical basis. Wes Montgomery, when I had the first time I had heard him, was on, a, of course, a radio jazz station. And uh, I, I heard this guitar that I had never heard before, you know, just like all of us do this with every player that causes us to go one step further. And it was just like you and everyone else in terms of uh, people who have affected you, stimulated you. Wes did that to me on the radio. I was struck in awe when Mom and Dad took me to see Wes Montgomery. He had come into Philadelphia at a long-gone engagement um, facility called Peps in those days in, in Philadelphia, jazz room. And he came in with the brothers, with uh, Monk and with Buddy at the same time. And uh, I, I saw him, in, what I noticed more than anything, because I was taken, all, I took awe of it, hearing him play, but I, what really affected me that evening is when he came off stage, he walked over to these two people with a 12-year-old little boy sitting at the bar, and he ordered a glass of orange juice. And here was a child that was seeing, looking forward to the right, the, you know, the freedom to be able to drink when I came of age, to smoke a cigarette when I came of age. Those days, uh, you walked into a jazz club and... Uh, you were in the fog of it all, you know, and, and this was something that was a, a dilemma in terms of uh, an ongoing experience of the unknown, you know. It struck me that Wes drank a glass of orange juice, yeah. nothing more. He was just a downright nice guy, you know, and he walked over and he put his arm around me and, and introduced himself, and I was in awe of this, you know. Um, through the years, me and Wes got very tight, very close, you know, and... Uh, I used to go up to his hotel room in, in New York City when we were, were working there. He used to be working at, at the Birdland, not the Birdland, at um, um, Cal Basie's on uh, 7th uh, Avenue, 133rd and 7th. And I was playing up at 135th Street at Small's Paradise. And I was about uh, 16 at that time, and uh, Les Paul 
came in, and I was very close with Les because I had met Les when I was 12 years old, and Les had never heard of Wes. And I took, I said, listen, I'm going to take you somewhere on my break and bring you to hear a guitar player I know you're going to really fall in love with. And I took him over to Basie's, and I said, listen, i got to go. i, I got to get back to the gig. Willis uh, needs me over there. And I left him there, and we had a, a close personal relationship. I don't know what to say. Do you hear you play? Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. I used, to, I used to sit there. You know, I used to ask Wes questions just like any student of the instrument would ask me today. What was that? What? And Wes would turn and say to me, listen, I can't tell you that. Why don't you just listen? <laughs> you know, he would come home from his gig. I would get back from my gig, and we'd sit in the hotel room and, and, and jam and, and play and relax. I've, over the last 10 years, uh, I've, I've been um, in Philadelphia and, of course, in New York. When I say Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I consider the East Coast uh, nothing but a, a maze of uh, suburban um, connections, you know. Uh, Philadelphia, to me, is a suburb of New York City. And New York City, of course, uh, has Boston in reach. Philadelphia has Washington, D.C. in reach. And right on down the coast, and of course, uh, touring-wise, uh, we're in touch with the entire continent, you know. Um, the last 10 years, I, I've enjoyed uh, a, a simpler way of living, uh, a personal, in many cases, very selfish, you know. Uh, in the process, I've had the opportunity of um, really enjoying using some new instruments, uh, such as the Roland systems of uh, synthesized, guitar synthesizers, uh, Macintosh computers and uh, different programs such as Visions and Finale and um, all kinds of personal endeavors that uh, when I was on the road with contracts and uh, personal management, I never had the opportunity to, you know. And I think the end result is going to be a, f a flow of uh, quite another uh, uh, series of events that uh, will be just as mystical to everyone else, uh, if only due to the fact that we rarely think that uh, any given artist lives a, a, a regular, normal life and <laughs> falls in love with his neighbors. And uh, in my case, Philadelphia is brotherly love, and uh, I have a ball with all of my neighbors and uh, many things along that line. I've had to catch up. Along other lines, uh, what caused me to have to make decisions to do this were out of control. I, I did have aneurysms. When I was here in California at MI, working with the rest of you guys, um, it just came to um, uh, a moment where it was impossible to go any further. I was given two hours to live, from two hours to two days. And uh, I flew back to Philadelphia to be with mom and dad, bless their souls, um, since I had so little time. And it would have just uh, capacitated them at that time if I would have passed away here on the West Coast. So I went back for that, and uh, in, in the interim, uh, the operations were extremely successful, and uh, although they did co uh, command uh, a great deal of recovery on my part, readjusting, uh, lack of retainment, quite a number of things. One day at a time, and to fulfill as much as I possibly can, and of course to endure and to solve problems on a face-to-face -face basis, and to be of help to as many as possible, and to enjoy that. I mean, there were many times, you know, when, when uh, I was younger, uh, based upon the instrument itself and its demands and facility, uh, trying to get my chops up, so to speak. Uh, that's all that I, s I saw. Nowadays, it is so much pleasure to me to be able to do the mirrors in the house, do some vacuuming. Um, go out and, and buy some food and say hello to, uh, and to watch the sparrows, you know, and to take a couple of pieces of bread and feed them. Uh, I groove on a lot of things that, I, that passed me by at younger, in younger years because of my nomadic existence. I didn't have the time to do
I really hope that you've enjoyed what we've been doing here today in depth in such a way that uh, you're gaining some insight over a long, long period of time. They call this instrument, uh, in terms of slang, a box. In the case of what I've shared with you, it's very, very close to Pandora's box due to the fact that it's infinite in proportion and it can go many, many different ways for the rest of your days. I hope that you've gained insight, as I've said before. Welcome. You've made me feel at home by having an interest in this project. And I hope to see you again sometime soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.